Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to take just a couple of moments uh, to let people sort of settle in, trickle in, and then we'll kick things right off. Thanks for being with us today. Okay, I think enough moments have passed. <laughs> so we're gonna get things started. Um, welcome to uh, this special Zing Train webinar interview. Uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. Today is Satisfaction Guaranteed, a virtual interview with Nikki Maynard. My name is Katie Alexander. I am Zing Train's new community builder. Uh, and I am thrilled to be here alongside our fabulous stars, Mickey Maynard, the author of Just Released Satisfaction Guaranteed, a new book about Zingermans, and Ariana Teas Leon, who is one of our trainers here at Zingtrain. We also have behind the scenes Mara Ferguson and Alice Rolfchin, our keynote liaison and digital marketing manager, respectively. They will be modern, monitoring the chat and questions with me. We are coming at, to, at you live from Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, and we would love to hear where you are tuning in from. So feel free to drop your location in the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and if you read about anyone who's tuning in from the same place, be sure to say hi, make a new friend with your neighbor. Um, we're going to dive into the good stuff very soon. I have a couple more housekeeping things to go over. Um, as far as the format of today's interview, Ariana and Nikki are gonna be in conversation for about 45 minutes and we'll leave time at the end for a Q&A. We will be collecting questions for the Q&A segment um, throughout the interview. And we would like you to submit questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we look forward to them and we'll do our very best to get to as many as we can, but we don't anticipate that we'll be able to get to all of them. So if you like questions that other people are asking in that Q&A section, um, please upvote them. And then we can prioritize your most burning popular questions. There is also closed captioning available during today's presentation. And if you would like to turn that on, Mara is going to drop some details in the chat. And you can find the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen as well. Last item of business is that we will be recording this conversation and sending out the recording um, by the end of the day. So be sure to look in your inbox for that. It will also live on our website, zingtrain.com in our resources tab for all of time. And so you can watch it there, share it from there. There's also tons of other free resources, including past webinars available there. All right, that's all for me. I'm gonna turn it over to Ariana to get us started. Thank you so much, Katie. Mickey, it is such a pleasure to talk with you today. And I have to admit that I first knew of you as Mickey Maynard, friend of Zingerman's, as <laughs> many of us Zingerman staff know you and adore you as a regular oh. at Zingerman's and also as a writer for the Ann Arbor Observer. I later realized that you are also the Micheline Maynard, New York Times, Washington Post, Forbes journalist, NPR correspondent, business book author, and food writer. So I'm really excited to have you here to tell us about your new book, Satisfaction Guaranteed, How Zingerman's Built a Corner Deli into a Global Food Community. Now at Zing Train, we do spend a lot of time talking about Zingerman's philosophy from a very enthusiastic, albeit biased perspective. <laughs> so I was thrilled to read your book and see Zingerman's through your uniquely qualified and informed, but independent view of what we do. I know we fully trusted you with our story and I appreciate how you captured it with honesty, thoroughness and true journalism. So thank you so much for writing it and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I have to say that in writing the book, everyone at Zing Train was incredibly helpful and I sent dozens of questions over about very specific things at Zingerman's and always got a super quick response from Katie, from Maggie when Maggie was still there. She was still there when I started writing the book. 
And it was just a pleasure to work with everybody at Sync Train. Thank you. I would like to start today with your story. Can you please tell us about your journey as a journalist through automotive, business, and food <laughs> journalism? Yeah, so I actually started as a legislative reporter in Lansing. Um, so a little bit of background for everybody. I was born in Ann Arbor. My dad worked for American Airlines. My mother raised us and then went to join the staff at Eastern Michigan. And she was one of the organizers of UAW Local 1975. Shout out to anybody who's in the union who's watching. Um, they were the technical and professional employees at Eastern. So she walked a picket line in order to get recognition for their union. Um, and so I did, I do not have a journalism degree. I actually have a degree in political science and uh, constitutional history. So I'm a little bit like Ari and that Ari studied Russian studies and ended up in the restaurant world. And I studied political science and other topics and ended up being a journalist. Um, I started briefly in Detroit for United Press International. And then I went up to Lansing and covered the state house the Public Service Commission and Michigan State Sports. And yes, I was the only woman in the press box at the time. And one day uh, it turned out that the automotive editor at UPI was leaving and it was a national position. And I applied for it, I was 24 years old, I applied for it and I was told no, because they didn't think the union, my mother's union would talk to a woman. So the, I, I went over the head of the person who told me no, and I got the job on a six month tryout and they aban aban abolished the tryout about two months in because they could see that I could do the work. So I covered automotive for a long time. People, especially in this area, will know me as an automotive journalist for places like USA Today and the New York Times. And by the time I covered all the bankruptcies at the car companies, which were pretty brutal. And I'd written several books about the auto industry. I figured I had done that long enough. And I left the Times to go to public radio. I've taught at Michigan, at Central Michigan, at Arizona State. Um, I've done a couple of fellowships. I did the Knight Wallace Fellowship in Ann Arbor. I did a Hoover Fellowship at Stanford. And then I, what did one more stint at public radio and moved back to Ann Arbor and have basically transformed myself into a food and business journalist. My column at the Washington Post is ostensibly about business and culture in the Midwest, but anyone who reads my columns will see that I'm always sneaking food people into those columns. And so that's kind of what led me to the point where the idea of this book came up. That's what I was hoping to ask you next was in terms of the books coming up, but the book when Irene Goodman, the <laughs> respected yeah. literary agent, when she approached you to write this book, what was your initial reaction? So I got an email from her to an email account that I don't check all that often. And it was Thanksgiving weekend of 2019. And I thought maybe I should go look at that email account. And I had this email from her. And at first I thought, okay, is this like the prince that wants to send you $20 million if you send them their, your social security number? And I did some Googling of Irene and obviously she's a very respected literary agent. And she was shifting more from fiction and regular nonfiction into business books. She went to Michigan, she has two degrees from Michigan. She's a huge fan of Zingerman's. She loves the pecan raisin bread. I think she gets a shipment of bread every month. And she knew the Zingerman story and she thought that that would make a great business book. One of the things you do as a journalist is you look for what's called the news peg. And so what would be the reason to write the book? And we hunted around a little bit and it looked like the 40th anniversary would be a perfect news peg. And we met Irene and Ari and I and Kara Watson from Scribner's had a phone meeting on March 15th, 2020, which was the day that people may remember that Governor Whitner announced the stay at home order. And Ari came to the meeting and said, this is the worst day of my life. I just had to lay off 300 people. And this was at a time when Zingerman's was hiring. 
So that immediately became an aspect of the book that I didn't expect, um, but which really informed all of my research and reporting and writing as people will see in the book. I'd love to ask you more about your process too, in terms of did it need to change because of the pandemic? Well, I had said to, so one of the things I thought I would do when I wrote the book was I thought I would go to places that, you know, the Zingerman's diaspora, you know, there's folks in San Francisco and Boston and Chicago and New Orleans and Oxford, Mississippi, and all those places that have a Zingerman's influence. And I was fully expecting to hit the road and, and go visit folks. And I was really able to do that. So it was a lot of phone interviews, but the nice thing about being here in Ann Arbor is that everybody at Zingerman's who felt comfortable doing so made time to meet with me either by Zoom or one-on-one. -on -one. And as places reopened, I could kind of go in quietly and do a little observation and um, my own reporting. So in, in retrospect, I mean, I probably spent more time inside Zingerman's than I would have had I been able to travel. And I, I think that it shows up in the book. That's, yeah, thank you so much. I One quick question, did you write a vision for the book? So you write a, what you, for to sell a book, you write a, a proposal, a book mm -hmm. proposal, which is, I have to be honest, I think this was the easiest book proposal I've ever written because I just knew Zingerman so well. And I had an idea of where I wanted the book to, end up sort of. Now, what ended up happening was because of the pandemic, we had a whole extra chapter to add in to the book proposal. And then Ari was kind enough to share the actual vision for 2032, which was just being finished at the time that I wrote the book. So it, I didn't write a vision so much as an outline. And I think an out, book outline is more detailed than a vision is. Was there anything that you found surprising while researching vision, uh, researching Zingerman's, either about Zingerman's itself or that broader community that you mentioned? So I had a number of conversations with Paul on the phone or by email or whatever. And so I would listen to talk, Paul talk and all of it sounded very familiar to me from covering the automobile industry. I started to see, so I'm a student of manufacturing and very specifically Toyota. I have been in all of Toyota's factories in North America and many of their factories in Japan, their factory in Valenciennes, France. Um, I've been in their factory in Brazil, you know, so I know Toyota really well. And I started to see all these threads that were connecting Zingerman's to Toyota. And I asked Paul about that. And he said, well, first of all, we have people at Zingerman's that worked at Toyota, but Back when we were getting started, I read this book by W. Edwards Deming. And immediately everything clicked because Dr. Deming was the American who went to Japan in the 1950s. And he helped the Japanese manufacturers focus on quality and get back on their feet after World War II. And he's famous for his 14 points about quality, which are in the back of the book. Dr. Deming also spoke to one of my classes at Columbia University Business School. So I had the pleasure of actually, he's quite old at the time, but I had the pleasure of actually sitting in a lecture with him and meeting him. And so I think that was for me as a journalist, the biggest surprise to see the links between what they call TPS, the Toyota Production System, and Dr. Deming's focus on quality and Zingerman's. I really never expected to see it you know, in the deli. I mean, you don't expect walking up to the deli that it's actually going to be this hive of quality focus, but it is. Wonderful. Yeah. And well, well, I was going to give some away some surprises for the book, but maybe I won't give it all away. <laughs> some of the Zingerman's businesses are very tied to the, the Toyota way at Lean. Yeah, and Jeff Liker, Professor Jeffrey Liker, who's a friend of mine, has actually come out with a graphic, they call them graphic, his is not a novel, it's a nonfiction, but a, a comic booky look at TPS and mail order, which I wish he'd finished it before I wrote my book, because there's a lot of detail in there that 
that I didn't have. But then again, my book is meant to be a quick read and he can go a little deeper in, in depth than I'm able to go. Awesome. I look forward to, to looking up that one. Yeah. Um, back to the Zingerman's diaspora, when you interview different chefs and business owners who were inspired by Zingerman's and came to learn from Zing Train, which classes did they find to be especially valuable? So Rick Bayless in Chicago told me that Zingerman's focus on service has been the most uh, valuable to him. He said that, you know, Rick is, is got kind of a dry sense of humor. And he says, you know, that Ann Arbory way doesn't work in Chicago because it's such a big melting pot of different people versus a college town. But he said that the Zingerman's focus on great service has been super valuable to him. And also the idea of storytelling, which Zingerman's does very well when it explains to customers, you know, where things come from, what the ingredients are, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, there's a young woman named Kat Gordon, who's in Memphis at Muddy's Bake Shop. And Kat told me the bottom line change is actually she says visioning gets a lot of attention, but bottom line change to her has been more valuable because she wants to be able to demonstrate to her staff how they can have a specific difference in what they're doing. And Kat, so Kat had a real kind of trans, transformation during the pandemic because when she went into the pandemic, she started with three uh, bakeries in Memphis. She had her original bakery and then she'd expanded to two more locations. And during the pandemic, she shrank down to one location, but she completely overhauled her original location and has added a teaching kitchen for both teaching how to bake things, but also teaching visioning. Um, and so it's very exciting to see her in, and she loves Maggie Bayless. I mean, she just, that's her hero. And she said that that essentially opened her eyes to not only being a better manager, but being a better person. And then Joanne Chang in Boston, who I got to know when I was living in Boston, love Joanne, love everything in her shops. She has sent a series of people to Ann Arbor and then brought sessions over to Boston as well. And then Alon Shia, who I knew and then didn't realize knew Ari. Um, Alon and Ari, I think he kind of uses Ari's, I mean, I would call him a father confessor. Being Jewish, that's probably not the right term. But he said that he had a long car ride with Ari at a very critical point in his culinary career. And he has really adopted many of the Zingerman's um, philosophies towards teamwork and towards focus and essentially making sure that the old ways of the restaurant world aren't carried forward into his new ventures. Yeah, really, really important work. And we always love it when people create their own variations and adaptations. Well, the interesting thing for Alon, so Alon, um, and it's a little bit explained in the book, but he, he got in a legal dispute with the Besh organization and ended up losing his, his restaurant with his name on it to the successor to the Besh organization, opened two new restaurants, Saba and Safta, and uh, uh, opened them with the idea of using Singerman's philosophy in them and now has a very glitzy new restaurant called Miss River for Mississippi River in the Four Seasons Hotel, which is very fancy down there, but he has applied the philosophy to Miss River as well. And you would think it's easy to do it when it's under your leadership, but then you go into a big fancy hotel restaurant. But he told the Four Seasons people, this is how I wanna do it coming in. And they said, absolutely, we support you in this. Wonderful, thank yeah. you. Sure. We've also, where I'm going to take this more towards the pandemic side now, we've been talking a lot at Zing Train about how you can't process trauma while yeah. you're experiencing it. Right. I'd love to hear your thoughts on pandemic trauma and also what is your advice for both leaders and individuals on how they can acknowledge that and work right. through it? Yeah. So. I have to admit now, looking back over the last two years and having conversations with people about 
making changes during the pandemic, that there was an extraordinary amount of work that took place in the Zingerman's businesses. And I was just in the deli a couple days ago. And, you know, if you read the book, the line, you know, the, the sandwich line was eliminated and everything pretty much went to either phone orders or pickup or delivery. And now the deli, I think it's on its fourth iteration since the pandemic started in terms of its appearance. And at one point, all the sandwich boards had gone away and you know didn't really look very much like the original deli. But I noticed the other day that there's a sign board up in the front of the deli that lists the going prices for cheeses and meats and and um, pickles and things like that. And it looks kind of like the old, a little bit like the old signboard. And then in the back, there've been posters that have gone up around where the line used to be. And there are now the order kiosks and now the grab and go thing, which I think is a terrific idea. And it's, it's closer to Zingerman's Deli the way it was before the pandemic than it has been in a long time. And I think the Roadhouse is doing, it's, it's best to kind of get back to the original roadhouse, but because there's so much carry out, they've had to resection the front of the roadhouse to make sure that the carry out can be done efficiently. And so I can still go in and sit at my favorite seat at the food bar facing the kitchen, but there's going to be activity, more activity around me than there might have been three years ago. And same with the bakehouse. I mean, I was there yesterday, actually. I went and picked up some of the hamantaschen for Ukraine. Um, and we talked about that in a second. That's one of the reasons why I'm wearing blue. And also this is uh, colorectal cancer awareness day. My friend, Christy McDonald, lost her husband to colorectal cancer. And my brother is a very successful colorectal cancer survivor. And so I'm honoring both Ukraine and colorectal cancer survivors. So anyway, getting back to the bakehouse, um, there are big plexiglass sheets up and it's organized on a line, but it, um, it seems more like the bakehouse than since 2019 too. And I think that everybody's being very careful and still wearing masks and limiting the number of people inside. But I, I feel like, it's maybe 70% of the way back to where it was before the pandemic. And obviously one of the big changes was in coffee and candy, but I think it's kind of fun to have coffee and candy together because you can get your coffee and then you can go get some candy and what a nice combination that is. Yeah, delightful. Stare at the candy, look through it while you're waiting for your coffee. Well, and I, I had a moment, um, you guys probably know this, that my parents, my because my dad worked for American Airlines, they could travel and they went to Massachusetts often. And when I was about eight years old, they came home with a box of marzipan fruits and they're very popular in the Italian community in Boston. And so we tried to always have marzipan fruits when my parents were alive. And then I walked into coffee and candy one day and there were marzipan fruits. See, I'm choking up and I just had an emotional reaction to seeing the marzipan fruits. So you just never know what a business is going to do that will sort of trigger that memory. And that was very special to me. That's beautiful. They, yes, thank yeah. you. Um, in terms of other businesses too, I know you're keeping a, a close eye on restaurants and food businesses coming out of that hibernation mode. Are you seeing those, ex those trends? continue to improve? Yeah, so I think a couple of things about that. Um, the staffing issue continues to be a real issue for lots of places, not only here in Ann Arbor, but in Detroit, in Chicago and elsewhere. Although I was happy to see today's jobs report and it looks like restaurant employment is starting to come back. But I feel like the restaurant industry in the last couple of years has just gone through this enormous amount of change. We were talking about trauma a second ago. And, you know, it's never been an easy industry anyway. And so even before the pandemic, you know, kitchen culture wasn't always friendly. Servers didn't always get a friendly reaction from every customer. And so 
we, we were already seeing that. And then here comes the pandemic and hostility just came to the surface because I think people were feeling so frustrated at seeing their daily lives change that they were taking it out on who they could take it out on. And a lot of times it was folks in the food business because that's who they would come in contact with. And I think, you know, I'm getting back to your earlier question about processing trauma. I think what everybody has to be aware of, and I'm sure they are, is that this is such a change from the way things were three years ago. And change is very, very hard for people. There was a book called Who Moved My Cheese? And just tiny little things will set people off. And so the pandemic was a huge thing and it definitely set people off. And so I think processing the trauma of the pandemic, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post about grief and the fact that you know, we've lost a million people to COVID. And if you think about it, like every person who died affected 50 people you know, in their circles then that means that 50 million Americans are feeling the trauma of losing someone and that we don't really talk much about grief in the workplace. And I think now we have to be aware that, you know, it could be like me seeing the marzipan fruits and crying. I mean, a manager might look at that and say, why is she crying? But that's that was something that I felt. And then if you look at Ukraine, there's a lot of Ukrainian Americans and then people like me whose ancestors came from Latvia and all of us with roots in Central Europe are feeling what's going on. So I think it's incumbent upon managers to ask questions, to be sensitive, to maybe listen to converse, if, if they're in person, to listen to conversations that are going on in offices. And then if it's like on a Slack, channel and you know people are chatting before a meeting kind of be aware of what people are saying to each other and i think it's tough as a manager because we've got all these responsibilities of revenue profit supply chain all the stuff that goes with these jobs and then to be working with our staff and trying to be sensitive to what people individual people are going through it's a burden but the one thing is, you know, if you look at Zingerman's and how Zingerman's has come through it, um, revenues are almost back to 2019 and probably will be this year to 2019 levels. So you can get through it without too much damage. And I think stories like Zingerman's are inspiring to managers that want to know, can I, can I cope with this? Tied to that, what can leaders or organizations do to create space for that conversation? Yeah, so I, I think um, we had something happen at the Washington Post where we had just a wonderful editor named Fred Hyatt, who actually founded the opinions section in, in 1999. So he had been editor of Op Post Opinions for 20 some years, and he died. He died last fall and I was shocked because I was just getting to know him. He's lovely to me, but then there were people in our staff that had worked with him for two decades. And one of the things that the Post did was it made room for people to mourn. And day after day for about a week when Fred died, there was a column in the Washington Post from a different writer who had a different kind of experience with Fred and they ran the whole, like people were allowed to raise their hands if they wanted to write a column about him and they ran the columns and then they had a memorial service on Zoom because you know people are all over the country. And they acknowledged the fact that our leader had been lost and that everybody was processing that. And I think even now my editor, Mark, um, has, I, I lost my aunt about six weeks ago and I told him about that. And he said, you take as much time as you need. You know, if you need to skip writing for this month, don't worry about it, you know? And he was super understanding. And then likewise, right now, the post opinion section is, you know, all Ukraine all the time. And I have, I have a column that's waiting to run, but I said to, to Mark, I mean, I know Ukraine is top of mind right now. So my I wrote my column so it will hold up 
if you can't run it for a week. So I think we're all just trying to be aware and concerned about each other. I really appreciate too with your piece that you wrote for the Washington Post on having kindness and patience for each other. I, that really hit me at an important time of the, the chaos was still going. And the yeah. fact that you were able to write that on, let's be kind to, e to each other, it was very meaningful. Well, I had several conversations with different people in the Ann Arbor area. And it, what actually kicked it off was I went over to the Right Touch and had a conversation with Layla, who is the owner and she was telling she'd been to a, a, a gift show you know she's in the gifts segment and she'd gone to a big gift show and they told her you know we'll take your order we can't guarantee three weeks we hope you'll get it before Christmas we may have to substitute colors and she's like you know I'll have things to sell you know don't worry about that and then I talked to Lisa at uh, the tea house in Ann Arbor and she said, yeah, that she, she was concerned that her staff was being abused or here people were yelling at her staff out of frustration. And she's like, you know, take the, I know you might want a blue mug, but take the purple one. You know, it's this, this year, it's not gonna be next Christmas. And of course, talking to Steve at coffee about some of the challenges that he's facing. I, I hope they're ending, but with packaging and the supply chain. And I just thought I've had enough conversations. I want to put something together. And the column got an enormous amount of attention. And also I faced an enormous amount of criticism from people for saying, you know, you're defeatist and America, you know, we're a great country and we shouldn't have to put up with waiting for the blue mug or whatever. And I was just so shocked that people reacted adversely to the idea of being kind. And so it was a real eye-opening experience for me that what I would think would be a normal reaction of just human compassion, people didn't want to show compassion. They wanted their coffee mug, you know. So, so that was, that was a, a real teachable moment, I think, for me in terms of what I think is reasonable is definitely not what a chunk of the population thinks is reasonable. And I have to be aware of that. And it's not going to change what I write, but it's also something I need to have in my mind as I write. Do you think that I don't want to make assumptions, but that might be one of the lessons of the pandemic in terms of what might need to change or. Yeah, I think we all have to communicate better. Um, and I'm, I know a lot of the young people in Ann Arbor that are running the pop ups and they are, and some have brick and mortar and, and I'll get back to Zingerman's in a second, but one of the things that I think they're running into is that they plan on X number of people showing up for their events and then triple that number will show up and then they sell out like by 530 and their audience is mad because they aren't able to get. And so what a bunch of them have started doing is pre-orders. So there's a guy who runs Fork in Nigeria from Detroit and Columbus and he's basically like, I'm coming to York Yard please pre-order so you can be sure to get what you want. And Jordan at Side Biscuit, the same thing. I'm taking pre-orders and we will sell out. So if you want it, you know, order it. And so I think that we, all of us, you know, customers and owners and proprietors have to communicate and just say if for example, I went to Tea House and I wanted one of the macaroons for Ukraine and they were sold out of them, but they said, we'll have more and we'll communicate when we have more. And I think that's a very important lesson from the pandemic of just making sure everybody communicates with everybody. Wonderful. I am, we have quite a few questions from yeah uh the audience so i'm really excited to get into some of these questions sure. let's go back to uh some some cars uh how did your experience in automotive journalism inform how you approached this book well i um 
I have written four other printed books. I've written two eBooks and then four published books. And I think the end of Detroit, which is a book a lot of people might be familiar with was a good precursor to this book because it taught me how to take a, a subject and a premise and then report it out and to try to talk to as many people as possible and then go to the spot. So there's a, a, a phrase in Japanese called Genshi Genbutsu and it means go and see. I think you might use it there or have heard it there. And for me going and seeing um, was very important to do. And then also one of the things I found writing those books and writing this one is that the first interviews are kind of help, they're helpful, but not conclusive. So you do your interviews at the beginning and then you keep circling back. And as people tell you more stuff, then you circle back and check with the person and say, is this the right way to put it? And as you get a name, you check the name and facts and things like that. And so just as with my other book, I found some of the best information came in the very last interviews. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let's take a, a food note here. Um, someone said, I love that your book highlights the history of American food culture. Oh, great. Um, yeah. And can you paint us a little bit of a picture of Ann Arbor food culture in the <laughs> early 80s, like 80s? before or yeah. around when Zingerman's opened? So, because I grew up here, um, I, we had inexpensive restaurants for the students. We had, by the 70s or so, I wouldn't say we had a really strong farm to table movement yet, but we had Main Street Ventures and the people who were involved in that and obviously the Real Seafood Company um, and Mods, which is where both Paul and Ari worked. And Mods, I so Mods is for people who don't know, it's where Ruth's Chris Steakhouse is now. And it was cool. It was, our parents would go and we wouldn't mind going with them. I mean, there were some restaurants in Ann Arbor that were a little stuffier that we didn't want to go to, but we would go to Mods. And it was cool and it had kind of slightly trendy food. I think there was a place called the Wiffle Tree that people might remember in Ann Arbor. And that was a little more, more hippie, um, more sort of really trendy. And Mods was sort of middle trendy and we enjoyed eating there. And then Real Seafood came along, Grazi came along, um, the Earl came along. And then I worked at Jacobson's. I don't know if people remember Jacobson's department store, but I tended to eat more at the places towards campus town. And so we got an Olga's, we had Thanos the Lamplighter, we had Cottage Inn, which is the same Cottage Inn, we had Dooley's. Um, trying to remember a couple of other places that were there. And so it was sort of like, not the very top of the market like we have now. Um, and so Zingerman's came into that and I was actually living in Detroit when Zingerman's opened. So I didn't actually like go there in 1982, but by the time I came back to Ann Arbor from New York and DC in around 1995, it was in full swing. So I think one of the things about Zingerman's was that it coincided with the farm to table movement, the awareness of food and people's interest in learning about spices and balsamic vinegar and, and olive oil and things like that. This is a very, very educated city. So if we heard about food trends in California or New York, we wanted them here. It used to take much longer for them to get here. And now things are moving extremely fast. Wonderful. Uh, lovely question from Mohammed. It, this was one of the rare books that when you realize you're approaching the end, you feel sad. Oh. You want <laughs> lovely compliment. You want so much more of an amazing, oh. or pardon me, you want more of such an amazing inspiration and hope in humanity. It does exist. Um, it's not only existing in fantasy land, like many of my close friends tell me sometimes. Yeah. So the question is, yeah. when is the second book about yeah. Zingerman's coming out, or maybe a similar book about Menlo Innovations? 
Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, first, of course, I need to say that if you are interested in any of the specific topics in these books, Ari has probably written a whole book about it. So you should definitely investigate what he's written in the courses that Zing Train are offering. But I've been thinking about a follow up. Um, we haven't done anything about it yet. You know, Irene hasn't emailed me or anything, but um, they're just the, the people are crying out for leadership. And I read a lot of leadership books. Um, I would say I read a couple a month. And I don't think they're as interesting as Zingerman's, to tell you the truth. I think there's a lot more that, that could be explored. And especially as the food world is changing and we, we move forward into it. So stay tuned. I mean, this books take about, this took two years. And I'm sure Scribner my publisher wants to get through this book launch and the paperback before they talk about the next one. But yeah, I think there's definitely possibilities of more, more writing on Zingerman's and on other topics. So Wonderful. Uh, oh, great question from Dana. Mickey, you exude such genuine energy and grounded <laughs> expertise. Oh, Would you, you be would you be willing to speak more about your career trajectory experience through traditionally managed systems, male dominated sectors, such as the auto industry? Yeah. So let me just say, I appreciate that. And I think I get that enthusiasm and energy from my mother, Bonnie Maynard, who a lot of people in Ann Arbor knew, and was certainly the most optimistic person I've ever known in my life. And she lived to almost 102 and the only reason she's no longer with us is her batteries just wore out. Um, so I have been in male dominated arenas my entire career. I was up in Lansing and there were other women reporters in Lansing, but it was very male dominated. Um, I covered autos and boy was you know that a tree house as we used to say, but there were other women reporters after me that, you know, we had a solidarity. It was funny because the labor talks, you know, when the new contracts are being negotiated um, were always very male and there were smoking rooms and the guys would play poker. And I came along, a reporter named Barbara Porter from WJR came along, Marge Sorge who worked for Automotive News, a couple of other women who, um, who worked for the TV stations and we had our little group. And so one day Barbara was knitting, I was doing needlepoint. I think, you know, Mary was writing some notes to herself and one of the guys came in and said, you know, this place is going to hell. <laughs> and, but we kind of converted the guys because like we took over the press room one day and had a trivial pursuit contest and everybody divided up into teams. And we were having a great time playing trivial pursuit. And so we sort of, um, we sort of shifted the direction of that energy. Um, I will say that I'm very happy to see Mary Barra running General Motors, and she's been there for quite a while now. There are more women rising in the auto industry than there have been in a long time. But I do think, especially with the focus on SUVs and pickups and big vehicles, that it still gives off a very masculine approach to the consumer. And I'm gonna be very interested to see how electric vehicles do because they have basically been selling cars by the pound over the last 20 years, you know, like the bigger, the better. And now they're going to try to convince people that, oh, you know, we're green, we're electric. And I'm not sure that they've laid the groundwork for people to believe that yet mm. so and if anyone wants to know i have a prius it's 13 years old it's got 159,000 miles on it and i'm not interested in selling it um i'm just gonna keep running it as long as i can i do get 50 miles to the gallon so i'm not i can, i'm watching gas prices go up and i'm just kind of relieved that it's not going to affect me as much as it will the people with the you know the the 22 mile per gallon gas mileage. Ouch. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, uh, let me continue with the rest of Dana's question, which oh, was sure. 
Yeah. Um, in addition to that, if the Zingerman's organizational culture that you wrote about has opened up new reflections for you about the contrast between the that male dominated sector um, and how it can be applied to conscious business practices and community development post COVID. So or I think, COVID informed, excuse I me. I think one of the things we've all learned as more women have taken on management roles and as teamwork has become more of a focus within business. I think that the top down one person dictating everything style is just over. Um, I don't know how anybody got through the pandemic with one person making all the decisions because one person is certainly not smart enough to know all the nuances of a business. I think that if anything, the pandemic showed the value of teamwork. And also if you read my chapter on the pandemic and it talks about how everybody across the Zingerman's businesses was empowered to find answers for their businesses. I think you know, that's a lesson the car companies could read and, and, and apply across some of their businesses too. I think it's super important and Dr. Deming said this way, way back, you know, when I was in business school and he said, the customer did not invent the light bulb. You know, if it was up to the customer, um, we would maybe have never had cars to begin with. We would still have horses, you know. Um, and, the, and Dr. Deming said that you, you, can't, you can't just lay off like 10% of everybody because you might lay off the person that has the strongest relationship with your most important customer. So if you just, you know, whack off 10% of your um, staff, you, you, you don't know who you're losing. And so that's why I think the pandemic has illustrated just how important it is to tap everybody for their input. And there are going to be shy people that don't want to speak up and you have to go to them and help them add their input. And I think that's um, something I learned as a professor at the University of Michigan was to make sure that not just the same six people spoke in class all the time, but to not so much cold call on people, but just kind of smile and gesture at people and try to pull them in. Yeah, open, open that space. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So as people read your book, what do you think people will take away or hope people will take away from reading your book? So I, it's gonna be, so the book is kind of aimed at two different audiences and one is food and culinary and one is management um, techniques. And I think the food and culinary people are going to, first of all, someone had raised that question earlier about the history of the food culture in the 80s. And I think that it's important to understand that Zingerman's didn't just like spring out of, out of no context, that it was part of a change in American attitudes towards food. And I think that's a lesson that a lot of people don't understand and don't really get. And then I think another part in the food part is just how international everything is. I tell a story in the book about going to take a class from Patricia Wells, the great writer and teacher in Paris. And we had a seminar on olive oil and you know the olive oil producer came and we sampled all these oils. And then I came home a few weeks later and there they were at Zingman's, you know, and this is 2007. So we did have the internet and we did have food shows, but it wasn't nearly as, as mo you know, immediate as things are now. And then on the management side, I, you know, I think people will be surprised at just how much goes into Zingerman's philosophy that, you know, I was a department store employee and I was given, my training was, here's an order book, here's how to write up a slip, here's how to run a charge, and then ask one of your coworkers if you need to know more than that. And I think people will be very um, probably surprised at just how much training an individual employee at Singerman's gets. And you know, I'm always skulking around a little bit in the businesses, hoping nobody notices me, although that's going to be harder now. Harder. But yeah, and in fact, yesterday I was at the bakehouse and somebody said, 
that's you. And they pointed to the row of books in the bakehouse, which I thought was, oh, Karen, that blows my cover. But I mean, I'm always just listening in on how um, team members interact with customers and greeting them and telling them about ingredients and things and what they might want to serve a particular cheese with, or if you don't have the bread they wanted, what might substitute, you know, and it really does show up on the floor, um, uh, you know, inside the businesses. So I think people will read that and they might say, I don't have time, you know, I don't have time to implement all this training, I can't check in with them after seven days, I can't check in with them after a month, I'll be lucky if they're still there in a month, you know, why would I put all this time into training these people when they could quit and go to work at Costco, and I think, well, if you implement it, maybe they won't quit and go to work at Costco, you know, $27 an hour sounds pretty attractive, but it's, those are big stores and you don't necessarily get the kind of interaction with, with customers that you would inside a Zingerman's business or another type of business. So I'm hoping that there's, that there's something for pretty much anybody who would pick up the book. I'm gonna read one more audience question, but before that, thank you all of you who've been sharing little comments that you've purchased the book. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, That's so everybody. lovely to see. Yeah. Yes. All right. Last question. You have done a lot of things in a lot of industries. So what's next for you, Mickey? <sighs> um, sleep. Um, <laughs> I love what I do. So I have a couple different platforms, as people know. I write for the Washington Post and I write for the Ann Arbor Observer, and for anybody who thinks that those two are not related, first of all, Ann Arbor is a very smart town. And so it's very likely that people reading the Observer also read the Post or the Times or listen to NPR. So um, it isn't as far off as you would think. And also in meeting all the business owners in the Ann Arbor area, I'm, I'm always constantly hearing themes of stories that I can pursue for national outlets as well. So I am ready to travel. I'll tell you, it's been, I mean, obviously I have a bunch of book events lined up, but I am ready to go places. Um, I got to go to Canada a couple of weeks ago. The Times asked me to participate in their coverage of the blockade in Windsor. And I literally had to talk my way in because I didn't have time to get a COVID test. And they let me in. But I realized it had been three years since I had been in camp, just, a, you know, 45 minutes away. And so I look at all those wonderful trips that Food Tours is putting on and, oh my goodness, they're so tempting. And I have a lot of friends in different parts of the world and I just want to go visit them so badly. Um, so hopefully if cases are down and everybody's boosted, then I'll be able to do that. Phenomenal. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Excellent. I think we will uh, turn it back to Katie. It has been so wonderful getting to ask you these questions. We have yeah. lots more and I'm excited for that curiosity to, to continue um, as people follow you and, and go and read the book. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Oh, hi again. It's me. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us today uh, and asking such great questions and being so engaged in the chat. I think the energy of you, Mickey, has come out <laughs> in space. Like, just I think that people's hearts have really been warmed and inspired by who you are in the community and how you think about the world. Um, we really, really are lucky to have you. Oh, um, thank you. With That's us. So sweet. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I love so, my community, so I am very gratified to hear that. Good. Well, we love you too. <laughs> uh, and a huge thank you also to Ariana for being our interviewer today. Uh, and also to Mara and Alice for rocking out the chat, taking care of our Q&As and making sure all of our participants have felt heard and gotten their questions answered. Um, I want to say now that Satisfaction Guaranteed is out and available for purchase, uh, most anywhere you like to buy books. 
We, of course, highly recommend that you pick up a copy to support Mickey and her work and learn even more about uh, the past, present, and future of the Zingerman's community of businesses. Mara will be dropping a link in the chat um, if you'd like to shop from bookshop.org. It's an organization that supports local bookstores with every purchase. Um, and I'm sure it is also available most anywhere you like to buy books. And for spending this hour together with us, we, Zing Train, are hosting a flash sale for everyone on this call. Um, so all of our two-day seminars online are 20% off with the discount code satisfy for the next 48 hours. Also, we would love to hear what you thought of today's conversation and what you might like to see us talk about in future webinars. So we have a brief survey link that will also be dropping in the chat. Um, if you would like to fill that out, it only helps us improve the experience that we give to you. And finally, uh, we are gonna be sending out the recording of today's interview with some additional resources and links about where to find Mickey in the world. Uh, and so be sure to look out for that in your inbox too. And that is everything. Happy Friday. Thank you again, Mickey, for joining us. Ariana for in the interview. Um, take great care and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Mickey. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you. Cheers. Bye.